Hello, this video is for STAT 360, handout number 13, part A, and will include pages 1 through 15. Okay, let's get started. Handout 13 is going to again use the Minnesota Marriage Amendment data set, but I have included additional predictors in this version of the data set. That data set can be found in our Google folder for handout 13. Handout 13, part A, is going to consider model selection procedures. And in particular, we're going to be looking at metrics that are used for model selection. So the data set here has many of the predictors that we looked at when we were considering handout number 12, but I also have included information about all the different proportions or percentages for the different age categories, and also the proportions for different race categories. Many of these predictors are not going to be necessary after considering multicollinearity. So that's the first thing we want to do before fitting a model is check for multicollinearity. So like handout 12, we are not going to want to include both Democrat and Republican in the model because those two predictors are highly correlated with one another. I decided to include percent Republican because it has slightly more correlation, stronger correlation than percent Democrat for the correlation against the, predict, uh, the response. So here it's slightly larger than percent Democrat. We would proceed with checking for multicollinearity with all of these predictors. So that's what we have on page two, three, and four of handout number 13, part A. So sometimes, as we can see on page four, sometimes there's many correlations that are correlated with other predictors. So it takes a little bit to kind of think through and decide what predictors you want to keep or what predictors you want to drop. I will let you look at pages two, three, and four to identify the predictors that will be dropped and why. So our initial model here on page five is going to include percent Republican, per capita income, percent bachelors, and then all the way down here. So all the effects here in the construct model effects. Some of the predictors that I won't be using are percent Democrat, population per square mile, average household size, et cetera. And those are being excluded because of multicollinearity concerns. So let me go ahead and go into jump and fit this model. So this data set again has lots of predictors. We can see all of those listed over here. To fit the model, I'm going to select Analyze Fit Model. And then I'm going to put, get this centered in the center of your screen here, percent yes is going to be my response. And then I want percent Republican in the construct model effects. And then down the line here, per capita income goes in there bachelors, unemployed, the age group 25 to 44 was highly correlated with the older age group of 65 and older. So that's why that one was being excluded. So the age variables that I'm considering here are all of them except for 25 to 44. The race Predictors are going to be white, are going to be included, African American, American Indian, and other. Asian and Hispanic are not being included because of multicollinearity concerns. Just double check that we got that model correct. Because we're going to be doing lots with this model. Okay, that looks okay. 
we'll go ahead and if we hit run here, we're going to just produce a fairly complex multiple linear regression model. So here's our effect summary output. And down below here, I can get my parameter estimates. So this model is fairly complex. It has many, many predictors that we're trying to use to predict against, again, the percent yes. The people that voted yes on amendment on that amendment. Okay, so here is that model output that we just obtained. Here is the effect summary information. Again, several of the variables appear to be important, but also many also excuse me, also many do not appear to be important. So these are ranked here according to their log worth. The higher the log worth, the more important they are to our model. Model selection procedures will provide us a process for identifying what variables or what predictors should be kept in our multiple linear regression model. So many of these predictors do not have significant p-values. So percent poverty, for example, or percent age 18 to 24. So that means that the, we do not have enough evidence to say that the slopes are different from zero in those directions. And hence, those predictors are not helping us understand how to predict percent yes. And if we want to keep a parsimonious model, a simple model, well, then we don't want these extra predictors in our model. So before we go in and show you how to do these model selection procedures, I want to talk a little bit about different metrics that we can use to identify a good model. The metric that we've used up to this point has been just simply R-squared. There are many additional metrics that can be used to determine how well a model is fitting. One of those is simply the adjusted R-squared. So the adjusted R-squared is similar to R-squared. However, it penalizes you for having too many predictors in the model that are not useful. Okay, so this model that I fit here, this initial model, has many predictors that are not useful. When that's the case, it is better to use the R-squared adjusted than the regular R-squared. So why is that the case? Well, when I look at an R-squared, so here I've just fit a model that has, had, that has four terms in it. It doesn't have the age predictors in it, nor does it have the race predictors in it. When I look at this model, void of the age and race predictors, I get an R-squared of about 85%. What that means is that this model can explain 85% of the variation in percent yes. The additional 15% cannot be explained. So that 15% represents the variation that remains unexplained. Now, every time we add a predictor variable to the model, the amount of variation explained is not going to decrease. And in fact, it shouldn't. But what that means is that I can add a whole bunch of terms that have no predictive ability to my model, making the model more complicated, but my R squared is never going to go down or the R-squared just ignores the fact that I have put a whole bunch of predictors in the model that aren't useful. So R-squared does not take the number of predictors into consideration. However, the adjusted R-squared is going to. The adjusted R-squared is an alternative measure that provides a penalty for adding irrelevant predictors into the model. Here's what that adjusted R-squared formula looks like, and you can see that it uses the number of predictors in the model. Now, technically, the adjusted R-squared cannot be interpreted directly as the proportion of variation in the response that's being explained by the predictors because it has this adjustment factor on it. However, this quantity should be used and does a better job of quantifying the idea of unexplained variation 
while also worrying about using the minimum number of predictors. That notion of using the minimum number of predictors to get a high quality model is called a parsimonious model. Or I sometimes refer to that as keep it simple stupid. Here's information about adjusted R squared on the wiki site. There's additional metrics in addition to the adjusted R squared. And these are ones that are incorporated by jump. So these additional metrics are Mallow's CP here, information criteria, Aiki's information criteria, and the Bayesian information criteria. Formulas have been provided for each of those measures. The AIC and BIC use what's called the log likelihood function. The log likelihood function is beyond the scope of this course. We will the, can use these measures though. For AIC, we want that value to be small. So smaller is better for AIC. The same is true for the BIC number. That's the opposite of R squared. R squared, we want that to be larger. Adjusted R squared, we want that to be larger. But AIC and BIC, those metrics, we want them to be small. Mallow's CP falls somewhere in between. Mallow's CP is, a desire, is at the desired value when it's close to the number of predictors that are in the model. So in these equations, P is just the number of parameters in the model. I said predictors a moment ago. I should have said parameters. So we want to include the beta zero when, we're, you, when we calculate the value of P. So P is the number of betas that you're using in the model. So how can I use the model selection procedures in Jump? This is my fit model window. What I need to do up in the upper right hand corner is just select stepwise under the personality. That will invoke the model selection procedure algorithm in Jump. The window that we will get returned looks like this one here. We have to identify or specify the stopping rule excuse me, and the direction when doing model building inside of Jump. So let's talk a little bit about the stopping rule. There's three values that we can use for the stopping rule. Each have their advantages and disadvantages. The minimum AIC is just going to use the minimum information criteria, Aki's information criteria. The minimum BIC is going to use the Bayesian information criteria. The, the p-value threshold is how we've been building our models up to this point. So the p-value threshold uses significant levels to determine which predictors to include or exclude from the model. When you select this stopping criteria, you need to specify the probability to enter and the probability to leave. The probability to enter is simply the p-value that a predictor must have in order to be included in the model. The probability to leave is simply the minimum p-value that a predictor must have to be removed from the model. The default values that are set in jump are somewhat liberal, and the reason they're set to be these liberal values is because we don't want to miss any important predictors when building the model. In the end, we can certainly remove predictors that are not significant. So it's common to use fairly liberal values when using the p-value threshold approach to building a model. The other thing that needs to be specified is the direction. The choices there are forward and backward, and for the p-value threshold method, we can use a mixed approach. So what is the idea of a forward a forward model has no predictors to begin with. The algorithm identifies the best available predictor and that predictor is added to the model. This process is continued by adding one additional predictor at each step. A backward selection model starts with all of the predictors in the model. So a very complex model. The least important predictor is identified 
and removed from the model. This process continues by removing one additional predictor at each step. It is important to do this one step at a time because the effect of some predictors will be influenced by the inclusion or exclusion of other predictors. The mixed approach, which I said a moment ago can only be used for the p-value threshold stopping rule, starts with a forward process, but then at each step, it decides whether or not it should remove any of the predictors. So it's a mixing of both the forward and backward. So I think the best way to show you how the algorithm works is to go inside, to jump, inside of jump and use the algorithm. The output that we're going to get is going to be similar to what we have here on pages 13 and 14. So one nice feature when building models inside of jump is from my red drop-down menu under redo is to select relaunch analysis. What that's going to do is bring back the fit model window for this analysis right here. That's going to save me time so that I don't have to click all of these different predictors back into that fit or construct model effects box. So again, from my red drop down, say redo relaunch analysis. And that returns the fit model output from that model. Now what I want to do for the model building process is up here under personality, I want to select stepwise. I don't want to use standardly squares, but I want to select stepwise. And then go ahead and click run. This window is returned here, which is the stepwise regression control window. Here I can identify my stopping rule. It defaults to minimum BIC. I identify my direction, which defaults to forward. So here I can see that I have a column here that is going to identify whether or not a predictor is included in the model or entered in the model. If I click step here, and I'm doing a forward process here, what it's going to do is go and check which predictor of these listed here are most, is most important in determining or in predicting percent yes. It has identified the percent bachelor or higher. Up here across the top, I have the different metrics that we use to evaluate model, the um, quality of the model. So R squared here is 65, adjusted is 64. The CP value, the Aikis information criteria, and the Bayesian information criteria. Remember, we want R squared high. We want these measures over here to be low. And we want the CP and P to be as close as possible. So if I click step again, in the second step, what it's going to do is try to identify which predictor is most useful to be included next. Notice my R squared. So if I take percent, percent Republican back out, my R squared was at about 65. My adjusted R squared was at about 64. When I put that in, my R squared jumps up significantly. My CP was 310. My AIC and BIC, you can see those values. Now those should drop when I add important predictors. And they do. The CP went from 310 all the way down to 129. So a big drop there in the CP value. AIC and BIC went down as well. So what's the next important variable is going to be percent 65 and older. Again, my CP is dropping quickly. My adjusted R squared and R squared are moving up slightly. Just go ahead and keep stepping through here. And I'm just checking to make sure these things keep going down. So I'm at 436 on my BIC. My stopping rule here is BIC forward. So I want to go keep stepping until I find a minimum. 430 here. I'm going to click step one more time to see if I can bring it down. And it actually went back up. So here's what the model looks like. Here's my BIC, which is 430. If I take one more step and include 
African-American in my model, my BIC actually goes up a little bit. My CP here is about six and a half, which is fairly close to my P number of parameters. So this model here would be a good model to use, or at least that's the model that has been identified by using minimum BIC and forward. To run the model, I can just select Run Model up here in the top. We can see from our output that all of the predictors are significant or are important. Each of these bars under my effect summary extend beyond the blue line identified there. All of the p-values down here are significant as well. So this is the model that we should use or at least is a proposed model that we could use to predict percent yes. This model is parsimonious in that it is as simple as possible, but includes important predictors as well. My R squared for this model is about 93%. My adjusted R squared is at 92.5%. Before using this model, we should make sure and check the assumptions, check for leverage, check for irregular predictions, etc. One thing that should be noted is that the various stopping rules and the direction specified will not necessarily produce the same final model. So that's what's going to be covered in handout part B. Handout 13 part B is going to also include a discussion of how to automate that building model building process. All that we really have to do here is when we're building the model is just use the go button and step, instead of using the step by step button here. So by clicking go here that'll automate that process. If we want to start with a forward model again, so let's suppose I want to use AIC now and I want to use a forward process, you want to make sure that none of the predictors are included in the initial model. So by removing all there, I clicked remove all to empty all that, those predictors out of the model. If you're starting with a backward selection process, you want to make sure all the predictors are in the model to begin with. So you want to click enter all in that case, because the backward selection systematically removes predictors that are not necessary. As I said, by clicking go, you can automate this process and it will stop when the minimum AIC value is obtained here. And as I said a moment ago, the predictors that we use that we get from this model might be different than when I use the Bayesian information criteria. Okay, then that does it for handout 13 part A that covered pages one through 15. Thank you.